everybody, I'm in outer space at the moment, and I can see where Andy McPhee, my coach, lives. I'm watching him every day. This is your boy, movie maker Doug55, and today I have a very special guest with me, along with my coach, Andy McPhee. We have Janine Shepard, and she has an incredible story to tell, and we will allow her to share it. And I can see where she's at right now from outer space, where I'm at the International Space Station. <laughs> Welcome, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Good on you. And if that's what you're doing, I'm going to be closing my blinds if you're watching me every day. Um, I can see you every <laughs> day. So, Janine, thank you. It's, I really am honoured that you've accepted uh, our invitation through a dear friend of ours, Mark Fermi, who will also be uh, on the series in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, thank you. I just can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to do this. Well, so, I'm delighted. Um, Always great to connect with another Aussie. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 All right, Doug. Uh, um, over to you to uh, um, have a chat to Janine. For sure, yep. So Janine, how, how did you get to where you are today? You're an activist, you have the member of the Order of Australia, and you have proven a lot of people wrong on so many levels as far as your injury that you suffered a few years back. How did you get to where you are today? Gosh, Doug, that's how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> how many hours? Well, you know, I yeah. So I I live in the states. I'm coming to you from. I know you're coming from outer space. I'm coming from. I'm from <laughs> Wyoming. Um, so I've been here for six years. Um, I'm an author and a speaker. And once upon a time, I was an athlete training for the Olympics. So I suffered a very serious accident while I was out training. And, um, and for those, you know, I, the easiest way is, you know, I direct people to my TED Talk. I have a, a TED Talk called A Broken Body Isn't a Broken Person, and that's had a couple of million views. And that's really what prompted me to actually move to the States. I was at a, a crossroads in life, and I received uh, an email from a man in India who said he'd seen my talk and he was considering suicide. Um, but he said he didn't he said he had a, had an ailment for 19 years and he said I saw your talk and my life starts now and I realized at that moment that you know I needed to jump onto the biggest stage that there was and that was moving to America and I came over here and I got another book deal and wrote um, uh, you know I've written a lot of books that have very um, you know popular in Australia but I'd never written one that I'd um, you know, for the world and America. And so I did that and that's called Defiant. And we're currently, um, I guess, exploring options for turning that into a movie. And that's where our friend Mark Fermi comes in, as you said, Andy. Mm. Mm. That's really that's, uh, great. Sorry, Doug, you go. Yeah, that's really great. In fact, I'm a screenwriter myself. I've written two screenplays and this one I mm -hmm. wrote in only a single month. That yep, and this incredible. is based on the biblical story of Moses, and it takes place in the future on another planet. Oh, <laughs> that's why you were in outer space. <laughs> oh, yeah, partly. In fact, I just came back from my own fictional planet, Planet Kronos. Wow. Yeah, and this is... This that's so is cool. This, yeah, and this is the sequel to that one. Ray Guns of Kronos, War on Claudiusville, part one. Doug's uh, writing is incredible. Like, he punches out um, 500 pages in a month. Like, it's, um, yeah. it's incredible what he does. Um, Janine, that that's just an incredible story. Uh, and, and what you just said then is the exact purpose of this series is for someone out there from all the different guests we have from a huge variety of life and so, some have not had any um, traumatic events happen in their life. They've just made a choice when they were younger to do something and that's led them to becoming like Richard Norton, for instance, he just took up karate as a young teenager and he ended up becoming a world renowned martial artist, a, a teacher in jujitsu, a fight 
coordinator um, on movies. That's how I met him on a, a feature film. Mm -hmm. And he also was bodyguard to the Rolling Stones and David Bowie. So he's had an incredible journey of just a choice he made. So uh, if I'm correct um, in saying what you went through, it would have been down to choices you had to make for yourself, um, which led you to where you're going. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, choice, I think, is our superpower. You know, the spiritual teacher, like spiritual teacher Carolyn May said, choice is our greatest power, even more so than love, because first you have to choose to love. And I guess I probably jumped forward without explaining to people listening what, you know, the, I guess the really interesting aspect of my story is that, you know, when I was training as a young athlete for the Olympics, I was run over by a truck and I'm actually a paraplegic, although I am walking. And so I made a choice when I had my death experience to come back to my body. And then I made another choice, which was life changing in, in that when I left hospital in a wheelchair and I was told that I'd never be able to do the things I did before, I, an airplane flew over and I decided, well, if I can't walk, then maybe I can fly. And that decision and that choice um, changed my life in, in, in a remarkable way because I went on and became a, a pilot, a commercial pilot, uh, fly, an aerobatic flying instructor. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, so uh, really, you said you had a near-death experience. Is that what you said just now? I did. I, I actually call it a death experience because I left my body and I... Um, oh, how did you know, you know that you left your body? Did you see it? Yes. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I was out of my body, looking at my body. I knew people, I knew I was in, in, I spent six months in hospital. So for the first 10 days, I was in intensive care and the doctors were fighting to keep me alive. And I have a very clear memory or an awareness of not wanting to go back to my body. And of course, making a clear choice to go back and wondering when I did, you know, why did I come back? Because I knew I'd have to live as a person with a disability and, you know, from being an elite athlete to that, it was um, probably the most, you know, challenging, mm. without a doubt, experience that I could face in life. Yeah, that's amazing. And look, just when you brought that up, um, a couple of days ago, we interviewed another friend of mine, Ron, and he's, I think he's been in a wheelchair, I think he said 14 years, I can't actually quite remember the exact amount of time. But his was through an accident when he was a tank commander in Israel and he wanted, had one of the most highly um, technological tanks, but they backed into a wall and concrete fell down. He was the tank commander at the top and it fell down. And thank goodness he had a Kevlar suit and a helmet on. Um, otherwise, he probably might not have survived. But he's the same. He's exact words the other day and, and Ron's getting stem cell treatment and he's... Um, really working hard. He's a leader. He he's wants to transform the Middle East to peace. You know, he's doing everything he can to create education over there. And uh, he just said, look, you know, I, when the doctor said to me, you will never walk again, he said, you don't tell me that. He said, don't, <laughs> don't ever tell me that. He said, that's your opinion. And he said, I respect who you are. I said, but I will not listen to anyone tell me that I can't do what I want to do. So it's, and we, we, like we have people on here eventually who have vision impaired, hearing impaired. A friend of mine, he's a, a talent agent in, in LA. He's completely deaf. It's all sign language. And just watching every one of these people make choices to not, exactly what you said. I saw one of your TED talks when you said, uh, my body doesn't define who I am. And I thought that was a really, really powerful quote. Like it's so, yeah. so true. And I think we're, you know, I always think that we're given not what we want in life, but certainly what we need. And for me, you know, I, my whole life was about my body. That's who I thought I was. That's how I mm -hmm. presented myself to the world. So the one thing that was going to wake me up to who I really was, you know, to my own spiritual power, to my own true you know, self was losing the thing that I thought defined me. And that was my body. Yeah. That's Are amazing. You? Are you religious at all or no? You know what, Doug? I don't like the word religious, but definitely I'm spiritual. I think, you mm. know, religion has too many man-made um, concepts, you know, attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely, I mean, I'm spiritual. I think, you know, like they say, we're all spiritual beings having a human experience. Yeah. And, and I think too, like, 
when you know you said that you had that out of body experience like you can't deny someone telling you that especially you know someone um you know with with such great credibility and you've no reason to you know make something like that up and you know i've heard it a few times with people having similar experiences like that um i'm not, not going to share what i had happened to me because it'll take too long but i did meet a human being on this planet who it, it, i had three people with me when this happened and uh, ran into him in hollywood boulevard and uh he just kept following us around and he was getting to everywhere we went before when we were in a car and he wasn't. And so I, I just went, wow, if I didn't have three people with me, people go, oh, yeah, whatever, Andy, you must have been on something, you know. But so I get it. I've had that experience. Uh, it wasn't a, a, a death experience. It was just this person was there because I'd insulted him. I was a pretty angry guy and he was a homeless guy and I insulted him and he followed me around until I finally went up and apologised to him. And then we never saw him again. And my kids just went, holy cow, Dad, what was that? And I went, don't even worry about <laughs> yeah, it. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's a really personal thing, um, mm -hmm. Andy. I, you know, I don't often talk about, to me, my, you know, my story is not about my death or near-death yeah. experience. Because people are fascinated. Tell me about it. Is there something on the other side? And, you yeah. know, I always say, well, you know, this was my personal experience and it certainly changed me. But... Don't worry about what's on the other side. We're here in this body to make use of this time on earth. This is what's important. Don't be in a hurry to get on the other side. That's that's an inevitable. We're all going. Yeah, there. that's right. But make you know, make use of your personal lessons, your spiritual lessons, or whatever it is that you need right now. You know, and yeah. I think we have everything we need to overcome the challenges that we face in life. Yeah, that's a, that's so true. That's for yep. sure. I'm 100% in agreement with that. Yeah, Doug, you're, you, you know, you're testament to that, without a doubt. Mm. For sure. And I wrote about similar experiences in, my, in this biography of mine, the amazing comeback of an autistic spokesperson. And this is mm. my biggest oh. success story that's in the top 15 in the UK. It focuses on my high school education okay. and how I overcame depression. Mm. Hey, Doug, do you have any questions for uh, Janine? Yeah, for sure. How did you get the member of the Order of Australia, and uh, and uh, what was it like receiving it? Well, you know, um, I know Andy would probably know this. So I, you, you don't. Someone nominates you, so you just it's it's the it's a weird experience. Suddenly, you get this letter that says congratulations, <laughs> and you think, well, how did that happen? So um, it's just it's anonymous. Somebody um, nominated me, and and I won that. So or I was I don't think you say won. You don't think you win an order of Australia. No, you're, you're, yeah. Um, yeah. So that was an incredible honor and a great experience, and. Um, I got that for the work that I do. I'm an ambassador for spinal cord injury, um, Spinal Cure Australia. And so I got that for the work I do in, in raising awareness for um, disability and also for inspiration. So look, I, I don't know how it happens, but it's a, it's a great honor to be recognized. So yeah, 100%. What do you have I'm actually, oh, sorry, uh, go on, Doug. What do you have to say about future accomplishments and going maybe for the companion of the Order of Australia? Yeah. Well, I have what's called the AM. So it's, I don't know how it works. It starts with AO, then it goes to AM. And then um, I, I, I'm happy to have what I've got. I mean, I'm not driven, although you might find this odd, you know, for someone who um, is very sort of goal orientated and, and wanted to, you know, represent my country at the Olympics. Um, now it's, you know, it's very much intrinsic. I do have goals that I want, Doug, like I'm, you know, as I told you earlier, I'm, I want to, I'm really seriously considering applying for um, a PhD and that will be in, in um, spinal cord injury and positive psychology. But I just do what, you know, I mean, I'm not ticking off things because there's a to-do list. I'm ticking off things that bring me joy. And I think that's the difference yeah. now. Yeah, that's you know? right. And that's, that's a really big, Point. I only mentioned it to Doug before when we were talking. Uh, I was I, I was coaching someone the other day, and um, he's an actor and voiceover artist, and he worked at a coffee shop here for a long time, and then he, you know, just made some strong choices and changed his life around. And he said, "I'm basically retired now." He's 35. He said, "I'm not a millionaire, but I'm retired from 
being the waiter at the coffee shop because now all I do every day is voiceover looping. And he said, I'm working at what I, he said, I said, no, you're not working. He goes, what do you mean? I said, no, you're in retirement doing the things you love and you happen to get paid for it, <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's, it's I know, I mean, lovely. I think you, that's right. I mean, that's right, Andy. I mean, you've got to do what brings you joy. And I think you get to a time in life when you realise that, I mean, and I think right now we're in seminal times, you know, with the pandemic mm -hmm. and there's many opportunities. This is, I mean, this is a really tough time for everybody. Yeah. But it's also a time that's filled with gifts. You know, we get yeah. to get to sort of ask ourselves, well, what's really important in life and what do I love yeah. doing? And putting away, you know, putting aside the things that don't bring us joy and, and really looking mm -hmm. at the things that give life meaning. I have one question for you, and I'm not sure, Doug, I don't think Doug had this one written down, but you're a, a, a stunt flight instructor. Like, how on earth did you get to become a stunt flight instructor? That's incredible. Well, I call it, yeah, I call it an aerobatic instructor. But oh, that's there you go. Um, yeah. part, part of my story. You know, I, I, when I first started flying, I was, you know, out of a wheelchair and a plaster body cast. I was lifted into an aeroplane for my first flight and never thought I'd be able to become a pilot. But um, as it turns out, it was just one step at a time. And I ended up, you know, studying and passing my medical and passing my private license. And I really didn't have anything else in my life. You know, I had to turn away from my old life. I was studying a sports science degree and, you know, of course, training for the Olympics. And then when I got my um, unrestricted license, I went for my commercial license, I, you know, my, in, my instrument rating, my twin engine rating, and then I thought, why not learn to fly upside down? Ah. <laughs> and everybody, everybody thought I was completely nuts, but I did. I, and it was a challenge because I don't have feeling from the waist down and I don't have normal control in my legs, so I had to learn how to do that. And then they gave me a job teaching other people how to do it. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's really it great. incredible. And I love it. Yeah. It was, you know, for me, yeah, that, that's you know, amazing. Flying, flying is a great metaphor for life because, you know, from being paralyzed in a spinal ward to flying an airplane upside down, I mean, we're talking two ends of the spectrum there. Oh, gosh, yeah. That's, I that's incredible. I can fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and look, I. I'm sure you like obviously TED talks and doing in, um, you know speaking publicly. It's those shares that we do that affect people that sometimes we may never know how we've affected someone. But I, I'm really such a big believer in the coaching that I do with actors and the life coaching is sharing stories um, is so powerful because it, it affects people in ways you just. You just, you may never know, or someone may write to you and go, wow, yeah, you know, or just talking to people like this T-shirt I've got on, it's, uh, it says not all heroes wear capes. It's about dogs. Now, I met this lady in Uber probably two years ago. She's a British artist. She does amazing stuff. We've become really good friends. And she introduced me to Steve. And Steve is an actor. He was just about to do a stand-up comedy routine at the Edinburgh Festival because of COVID. It's cancelled. But Steve is ex-military and his other passion is dogs. He rescues, um, when I met him two years ago, he was taking 800 dogs a month out of LA on a specially uh, converted bus to Oregon to have them rehabilitated and then brought back. And But the only people that know he's doing it are the people that knows he's doing it. The rest of the world doesn't. And he, he has to raise 40000 a month through donations. And I think... Well, and he goes, Andy, he said, you have no idea the stress this causes me and I want to stop. He said, but I can't. He said, if I stopped, it would kill me because I know these dogs need help. So it's just getting out, meeting people, learning what other people are doing. It inspires you. And then it just creates things like this, like this. We're only going to do 10 episodes. It's probably going to 30 now because it's not even episodes anymore. It's just on the channel because we have yeah. so many amazing people. Yeah, just the fact I went with Mark the other day to have coffee is the only reason we heard about you because he just happened to mention it, you know. <laughs> I love the way that the universe works. And I think you're right, Andy. Um, you know, sharing our story, one of the most powerful things for me was when I, you know, began, I wrote my first book in Australia and began, you know, on the speaking circuit. And, and what it did for me was it took me out of my sort of small story into a larger collective human story. And I realised that I wasn't the only one 
struggling. I wasn't the only one with problems or challenges in life. So it just gives you an incredible perspective. You know, it, it, it just takes you out and you realize that we are all connected. We all have challenges. So we're all, you know, we have this sort of common human story. And I think that that gives us hope that, you know, that we're not alone. Oh, yeah, 100%. Doug. What, what's up? Your turn. Doug, how are you uh, going Doug, over there? You, yeah, Doug, Doug's such Doug a long way over there on the planet. What, what's that? <laughs> yeah, what's that planet? okay, I'll, I'll ask my next question if that's what you meant. <laughs> I, I think no, Doug, I was going to so, ask you, what planet? What planet is Doug on? Oh, yeah. what planet am I on? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm currently just above Earth on the moon, but I'm, at, oh. but I'm looking to, for the International Space Station <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> But I can see where you guys are from outer space. Of course. Wow, he's keeping an eye on us. I know, right? I think he was so I mesmerizing have my your story. Eye on you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug. Next question, mate. All right, next question. Uh, what was it like for you dealing with life after your accident? Hmm. That's a great question, Doug. And. Um, when I was in hospital, I spent almost six months flat on my back in, a, in the spinal ward. And when I got out, I was, you know, in a wheelchair and a plaster cast. And I thought invin I, I was invincible. And I got home. And, of course, like most people, once you leave the hospital, you know, reality hits. And I did get really depressed. And I just wanted my old life back. So that was a very, you know, challenging time for me immediately when I got out of hospital. And I realised that you know, we talked about choice. I realized that I'd made a choice to come back to this body. So I decided that I was going to let go of my old life and, and trust and trust in life and try to find out why I came back to my body. And really it was in that letting go that my life changed because it was in that moment that I let go that, that I saw that airplane and had that insight. Well, if I can't walk, then maybe I can fly. So, um, that, that's amazing. And, um, you know, like we hear a lot of people when they're talking or you see books about letting go and, um, you know, some people go, yeah, but how do I let go? Well, it's like if you hang on to a rope that's about to pull you over a cliff or in the water attached to a boat, you just let it go. Now, I know that sounds really simple, but it, it pretty much is that. A am I right? Like you've just got to let yeah. go. Oh, absolutely. But, the, you know, there, I always say, and I teach, you know, I teach, uh, I teach people the skill of resilience. In fact, I've just written an, an online course that we've launched. I have a, a company called the School for Resilience, and I teach people and give them tools, you know, based on science-based tools to <laughs> help them, um, what I call, build an unshakable core. So, and one of them is, one of the exercises we do is a letting go exercise. And, you know, there are things that I say, there are things that are easy to, easy to let go and things that are hard. For example, mm. you know, it's easy to let go of losing a tennis game rather than losing a loved one. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's different things, but we can practice, um, you know, letting go of small things. Um, and it's letting go of this. I think it's like a skill. Letting go is a skill. And mm -hmm. the more we do it and the more we practice it, the better we get. And the reason we struggle with letting go is because we hold on to things that we think define us and we learn that the the whole the harder we hold on the tighter our grip the more we suffer yeah that's, yeah that's so that's true beautiful. so that's true. true that's really you're really an inspiration to so many people and i have to praise you for all your accomplishments that's just great well, thank you, Doug. Well, that's really sweet to say so. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's, it really is just an incredible um, journey. Um, and look, Doug, I'm thinking we're out of time. So uh, I would just like to thank Janine before you will obviously do the same. Um, yeah, Janine, even though that was short, I mean, it was like it was a lifetime in a short period just to really get... Um, yeah. You know, it, like you said, everyone has a struggle here and there, whether it, you know... Um, someone just trying to get out of bed early every morning to get more done in their day. That can be a struggle for some people to, to let go of that. So you're right. It's, it can be anything. Um, and it just takes practice. Like habits are formed by over and over again. That's right. And, you know, I think we recognize with what's going on in the world right now is that everyone, 
you know, is struggling with this. And right now we've been going for months, you know, in this pandemic, and I think there's a p pandemic fatigue that's starting to hit yeah. people. And I think we need to do small things every day. I mean, today I made a commitment to to do, you know, like all of my speaking work for the year is postponed and moved to ne next year. So I've got a lot of time on my hands to to do other things, to write and to create the course that I've been mm -hmm. doing. Um, so, but we need to, you know, one tip I say to people is do, you know, look for some short-term goals right now because that helps us, you know, stay motivated. So yeah. ask yourself, what are the things in my life that bring me joy? And even the small things like looking forward to having a, a cup of coffee or a chat to a friend or a hot bubble bath or whatever it is, just, you know, really try to infuse your day with those small moments of joy. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, that's really great. Well, thanks, Janine, and I'll hand it over to Doug to um, say you. goodbye. Thank you. I feel like I've just got two new friends. Yes. Ah, that's really awesome. Now I can include someone from the Order of Australia onto my friends list. That would be great. Beat that, former <laughs> high school bullies. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. I want to thank both of my friends for coming on to my show today. I really enjoyed chatting with you, Jane, Janine, and uh, good luck with your PhD that you hope to get. And Thanks. followers, please check out my latest work of literature that's my biggest success story, From Green Flags to Blue Flags to The Amazing Comeback of an Autistic Spokesperson. And check out my screenplay, Mose and the Great Escape, based on the biblical story of Moses. And we'll see you next time on Being Relentless and Unstoppable.